Okay, well welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, our webinar today we're going to be doing steam trap testing with ultrasound. We've got Kelly Paffel with Swagelock Energy Advisors here. Uh, my name is Maureen Gribble. Um, hopefully most of you by now recognize my voice um, on these little monthly webinars that we do. Um, before we get started, just a little bit about UE systems. So we've been uh, manufacturing, selling ultrasound equipment and solutions for over 40 years. Um, we've got offices pretty much all around the globe. You see them listed there. Um, and, you know, one of the applications that we uh, use ultrasound for is obviously with steam trap testing. So it seemed like a fitting topic as we're all turning our heaters on for the first time uh, possibly for the year. Um, so obviously a good topic as we as we enter the the colder months. Um, just some housekeeping: we are recording this, so if you have to jump off early or you've got colleagues that uh, just couldn't make it, we will post this up on our website with all of our other previously recorded webinars, so you can take a listen then. Um, and there's also the ability to ask questions, so we encourage you all to type those in um, throughout the, the session. If uh, there's a question that it makes sense for me to kind of jump in and, and get Kelly to answer before he moves on, we'll do that. Otherwise, obviously, we'll have some time at the end for uh, some Q&A. So feel free to, you know, we'll try and make this as interactive as we can um, with the, the limits that we've got, obviously not being able to have everybody talking at once. We've got a good group here. So uh, utilize that. and. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn the screen over here to Kelly and let him get started. Right, and we can see your screen there, Kelly. All right, there we go. And Kelly, if you might have put yourself on mute while I was doing the intro, so I'm not hearing you, but... The, yeah, I wasn't sure if it was just me not hearing him, Kelly. You might have put yourself on mute. I'm not on mute. Ah, uh, there you there are. You there you go. I was not on mute. Okay, here I am. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, this is live TV, folks. We love it. So uh, <laughs> now we're good. Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> good afternoon. My name is Kelly Topham. I am technical manager for Swedgelock Energy. And just a little bit on Swedgelock Energy. Uh, we're a division of our parent company, Swedgelock, and we're located in Solon, Ohio, or Cleveland, Ohio. The division, uh, Swedgelock Energy, our focus is totally on steam systems. And the steam systems from the beginning, which is the boilers, turbines, distribution, and end users. Um, and to, we do project management, troubleshooting, diagnostics, a multitude of things, only particularly to steam systems. Uh, today I'm going to talk about testing steam trap stations using high frequency ultrasound, but I'm also going to go over a few of the other testing procedures. 
Um, you know, people always, I go into facilities to troubleshoot, and people always say, oh, wow, I'm glad you're here. You're the expert. I'm not an expert in STEAM. I really don't think there is an expert in STEAM. Um, I've been doing it for a very long time, and I'm still learning about steam the vapor and applications and components. Uh, I tell people I have a lot of knowledge in steam, and you get knowledge two ways. You ask questions or make mistakes. And I've made all the mistakes, at least once, sometimes twice. So if you do have questions, and you post questions here, or even at the end I'll give you my contact information, you have questions regarding steam trap station testing or anything on steam, by all means, you know, drop me an email. I'm more than happy to talk to people about things that work and things that do not work. So uh, when I talk about steam trap station testing, uh, I think that today we have to do more than steam trap testing. And people say, what do you mean steam trap station? You need to look at all the components in a steam trap station and what makes that up. Uh, just doing the steam trap today, uh, it's, it's only part of the program. Uh, you know, the thing is people say, I want to install a steam trap. Um, no, you should be installing a steam trap station. I'll talk briefly about it. And um, later, if you have questions or whatever, by all means, you know, ask me. What makes up a steam trap station? Of course, isolation valves. And people say, well, what's so critical about that? Most isolation valves that people purchase leak internally, severely. And uh, so when you go to shut a steam trap uh, uh, station down to replace a steam trap, it doesn't shut off. So people have to be familiar with the SCI ANSI standards and um, API standards for internal leak rate. Um, and the other thing is, is how many do you need? Uh, you know, if you're working at 150 psi, do you need double block and bleed arrangement to be able to work on the steam trap, you know, safely? And that's some of the people's codes and requirements. Strainers, all steam traps must have strainers ahead of them, typically ahead of them or internally, some method uh, to remove the corrosion material away from the steam trap. Uh, one of the biggest failures with steam traps is corrosion material. Uh, people say dirt. It's not dirt. It's corrosion material. And then again, the steam trap. Next component is a check valve. Is it needed? People always say, ah, you know, you put a steam trap in, you got to put a check valve in behind it. Why? Who told you that? The person associated with, steam, with the check valve? <laughs> you know? uh, we do use check valves in certain applications and other applications. No, we do not use check valves, you know, and not to get into that. So, and visual inspection valve or device, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about that. How to get started? You know, the thing is, is you got to get started. <laughs> I mean, uh, how do you get going? So, number one, who will be doing the testing? You know, you got to select somebody. You know, and the thing is, is that selecting one person, now nah, it got to be a team. You know, typically two people, maybe more. But you want to do is select the team. Select the correct equipment. Uh, you go out there and uh, to do steam trap station testing, you got to have the equipment. I mean, you go out in your garage and you're going to build shelving and you got all the tools. And the same thing when you go out and do steam trap station testing, you got to have the tools. You know, if you don't have the tools, you're not going to be successful. As simple as that. And uh, early in my career, I mean, uh, I come from plant operations and so on. You know, this gentleman, one of my mentors, that was like 58 years old, and very, very knowledgeable, was trying to teach me how to test a, a steam trap with a screwdriver. You know, it's pretty uh, difficult to do and not very safe, but hey, we didn't have the tools. But the next thing is train the team. Training, training, training. I mean, if you give the people a high-frequency ultrasonic unit and let them read the instruction manual, whatever, go out and try to accomplish, you know, steam trap testing, it's not going to be too <laughs> successful. 
I mean, because they're going to see things that they're not familiar with, and they get discouraged. So training, you know, um, UV provides training. So get some training. The infrared people provide training. Determine the data that's going to be collected for the collection process. You know, what data are you going to collect? You know, set priorities for testing the population. Uh, a big question is setting the priorities. People always see these things, you know, we, all right, we got to go out and test the 400 PSI steam trap because they lose us so much money. Mm, typically not, because the 400 PSI steam trap is discharging into a flash recovery system. And, you know, I'll give you an example. I went to Arkansas, and, you know, the plant called me there and said our, our losses are 2.1 million a year. And when I finally was went through the report that was done by outside firm, uh, savings was only like 80,000 because the high pressure system was just steam traps were discharging into a flash system. So if the steam trap is blowing through, it's just going to back down the PRV valve a little bit. So understanding the dynamics of the system to set your priorities. So make sure you have understanding and steam balance is a great way of doing that. Create a correction roadmap. Okay, don't get started unless you have a steam trap station standard. Okay. So what does that mean? What are you going, if you go out and find a steam trap to station to replace or a steam trap to, what are you going to replace it with? You know, uh, a lot of, you know, not a lot, a percentage of your steam trap failures is because of misapplication with the design of the steam trap. You know, installation standards. You got to have standards. I mean, that's the beginning of the, the program. And then next thing, validate your results. And I'll talk a little bit about root cause analysis because that's how you validate your test results. You go out and find a steam trap that failed, then validate it. A question people ask me all the time, what is the best way to test steam traps? Visual, infrared, or ultrasound? All three. To not go out there without having all tools, that's visual, infrared, and ultrasound. You know, I walk in plants all the time and say, you know, that steam trap is bad. He said, how do you know that steam trap is bad? It's upside down, okay, visual, okay. So you really want to use all three methods. One of the methods is, you know, inline test valve. Yeah, everything that you do in the steam system or whatever, you know, components of testing, everything I always say has pluses and has minuses. So positive on this, what you see here is a test valve. It's a simple method. You know, it's not much, you know, to train somebody to watch a steam trap discharge. Uh, and I'll talk about the operational design in this presentation, but not off steam traps. Open the atmosphere. <coughs> Discharges, shuts off, discharges, shuts off. Yeah, it's getting simpler than that. The thing with that is, is that um, I can get production people to be part of the testing group. Okay? So it's simple. Negatives. You're discharging high pressure steam into the atmosphere. There's a lot of cases that you know plants do not want that to occur. So it's a limitation or negative. The other one, visual, visual indicators like you see here, positive. The method to get everybody involved. You know, there's certain applications that when I put the steam trap station in, it's a visual indicator goes in right with it. You know, it's a way I can get everybody to understand if the steam trap is functioning and moving constantly as quickly as it's going. Negatives. You know, if it's leaking steam or it's linkage problems inside the steam trap, you're not going to pick that up. And, of course, it's cost. You know, it's going to cost some uh, dollars to put that into there. So that's your visual. Then we go to temperature. And yeah, temperature, contact. Positive? Yeah, you know, emissivity is not required. And, you know, you're going to make direct contact with the pipe. Negative? takes time to take the reading. You need some surface preparation. Contact measurement's not very fun. 
is about as much fun as drinking sulfuric acid sometimes. But in cases, there are cases that we use contact measurement. It is one of our tools. Like I said before, don't disregard any tools. Uh, Non-contact. Yeah, everybody has these. Infrared, non-contact, positive, easy and fast, you know. Um, negative, difficult to determine steam trap performance, which I'm going to talk about in a few slides. Target area, what you have to understand is target area, emissivity, surface condition. You know, one of probably one of the biggest things, target area. You know, I go into plants and they buy these low-end infrared units. And they're looking at a huge target area, and they're trying to shoot a three-quarter inch pipe. For, uh, it's very difficult to do that, because the further away you get from your target, the bigger area you're going to be uh, looking at. And people say, well, what's the best unit to buy? And the best unit is to buy, it really comes down to cost. Make sure you're buying an infrared unit about $1,000, well, because that, what that does is give you optics. Now, if you want to jump up to the infrared cameras, great. I like them. I have them. I use them. I mean, it's tremendous. It's got great optics to it. But if you have a $99 a unit and you're going out and testing a steam trap inlet with it to get a temperature, you must be extremely close to your target or pipe. So the thing is, is that you know, I'm, you say, oh, you're kind of negative on temperature. No, I'm not negative on temperature. It's just, it is a tool I use. And, and I tell you, if you go and go out and test steam traps, you must have temperature as part of your program. Because what I want you to do is just like here, is I want you to take a temperature up here at the inlet. That temperature is 299 degrees. The steam trap temperature should be what? Close to 299. Because when steam gives up its latent energy, it changes state from latent from a vapor to the liquid. There is no temperature change. Now, in the discussion, is there a pressure drop through the heat exchanger? Yes, but you know, always make sure you take an inlet to the process temperature and a steam trap body temperature. Because I'll tell you that your steam trap is in operation. So. And that's the beginning of the process. So the thing is, is that if you take an inlet temperature of 299 and your steam trap body temperature is 75% or lower than the inlet temperature, then I want you to stop because there's something wrong. You know, don't even proceed to the next step, which is using the ultrasonic unit. So the thing is, is that temperature is critical. Then we move into can I test a steam trap with temperature? And the thing on this steam trap here, you see the inlet temperature is 299 degrees Fahrenheit. You see the outlet is 214 degrees Fahrenheit. Is the steam trap functioning properly? And people go, wow, well, yes, because there's a temperature differential across the steam trap. So yes, it's working correctly. In essence, it's not. Because the constant return system is at atmospheric conditions, or 100 degrees C or 212 degrees. So the steam coming through the steam trap, you know, and it's going to have to go down to 212 degrees, you know, because that is at atmospheric conditions. So even if the steam trap is blowing through, you know, the steam is going to go down to whatever the condensate line pressure is. And people go, oh, there's your temperature will be increased. Well, if you do your piping correctly after the steam trap, the answer is no. It's going to be atmospheric. Are you going to pick up some super heat when you go through? Ah, oh, a little bit, but it's going to be dissipated. So, the next one is steam trap here. Is the inlet temperature is 299 degrees. The outlet's 278. And from what I was taught when I was young in my career, there's no differential across T1, T2. Is the steam trap functioning properly? Well, there's no temperature differential, so no, the steam trap is not working correctly. Again, the condensate uh, line pressure is 269 degrees. So, of course, you're going to have elevated temperatures after the steam trap. 
My point with temperature is you have to have it in your toolbox because it's critical in let, in, uh, to the process and to the steam trap body. But to determine if the steam trap is working properly, it's all dependent on the content return system. So it gets to be a little bit difficult. But it is one of the tools that we use. The next tool is what I'm here to talk about, the benefits of ultrasound. You know, first of all, uh, high, accurate, highly accurate, excuse me, fast and easy. You know, and people ask, what do you mean, fast and easy? Uh, the most steam traps I tested in one day is 810 steam traps in one day. You know, because the thing is, is that I was working with a team. I was the person using the high frequency ultrasound. And high frequency ultrasound, I'll give you an example. Uh, the technology, the best way for me to describe, it's like riding a bicycle. You know, the more you ride it, the more proficient you get. And I've been riding this bicycle for a long time. So I'm extremely proficient at testing or using high frequency ultrasound. The thing about high frequency ultrasound allows the operator, the ultrasonic, to hear the operation of the steam trap. So it gives me the ability to crawl inside that steam trap and listen to exactly what's going on inside the steam trap, which is tremendous, which no other technology gives me that. So it's great. It's fantastic. So now the units typically look at frequencies of 20 to 100 kilohertz, and I'm sure you've been through the ultrasound part. You know, uh, you know, human ear hears up to 20 kilohertz, and my wife says uh, my my hearing goes up to about two kilohertz. But anyway, uh, the thing is, is that my target is I use 25 kilohertz, and people say, "Well, where did you come up with that number?" Uh, from my experience of doing and using a unit, okay? But that is my preference. It's a starting point. You know, if you find you're more comfortable at 28 kilohertz, fine. But I'm extremely comfortable at 25 kilohertz. It gives me the best clarity of steam and constantly passing through an orifice of a steam trap. So, it gives a tip that what generates ultrasound, steam and constantly passing through the orifice of steam trap. It's not what you see down here, a laminar flow. It's a turbulent flow. And that turbulent flow generates a high frequency ultrasound. And that is what you're picking up with the unit. Now, I'll make a note. Because the thing is, this, this ultrasound unit provides you the ability to listen to the high frequency by heterodyting the uh, ultrasound to a more audible sound. Steam will make a distinct whistling sound. Condensate will make a distinct crackling sound. So I want to tell people when you're testing uh, a steam trap, P.S. watch the meter, but also listen. And the more you go along and you listen, uh, and the more time you're riding this bicycle using ultrasound, the more proficient you're going to be and just putting the, the unit onto the steam trap and listen, your your test will be instantaneous. It's a fast and easy test method. But always listen. You know, steam will whistle. Condensate will crackle. Positive, fast and easy. You know, highly accurate. Can detect many other defects in the steam system. Well, I get to it. The biggest negative, training. I mean, you know, the thing with this unit is that it, it does require training. I give you an example. The first time I came across this, you know, uh, you know, I was in working in power plants at night when I was going through school. You know, and when I was doing that, what I did was what everybody else didn't want to do. But anyway, I, they give me an ultrasound unit, told me to go test steam traps. So I'm out there with this older version of ultrasound testing and so on. The pipe that are beside me says, you know what, you're a moron. I said, what do you mean I'm a moron? <laughs> you're testing the check valve. I said, hey, give me a break. I don't even know what a steam trap is, OK? I said, they give me no training. Yeah. So what was my accuracy going to be? Very well. So training is required. It's not that difficult. Steam trap station to ultrasound proper operation. What I can find is the steam trap is working correctly, period. Okay. 
a very simple. Uh, failures. Blowing or steam or completely fail is a failure. Very simple to pick up. Leaking steam, I can find that, not a problem. And with experience, you can determine the degree of leakage of steam. Leakage, uh, failure, where? Yeah, I, again, the ultrasound gives you the ability to, like, I would say, climb inside the steam trap and actually get inside and see what's going on. You know, undersized. You know, one of the failures of steam traps is sizing. You know, the ultrasound gives me the ability to determine the sizing because I'm looking at the cycle times and, and discharge times and things like that. So it really gives me the ability to see if the steam trap is sized correctly. And if an undersized steam trap will wear itself out in a very short period of time and cause premature failure. It also gives me the ability to check air vent failure on a one particular design of steam trap called the FMT, which I'll get into. But the other thing is the term isolation valve internal leakage. Yeah. The other thing that gives me the ability to check uh, for check valve failure. You know, one of the things is that you get an ultrasound and you will find in a percentage of the cases that it's not the steam trap making the sound, it's the check valve. Okay. So you'll be able to determine check valve problems. And the other thing you'll be determine upstream and downstream problems, which I'll get into when I talk about the testing points of a steam trap. So there you go. There's your things you can test. Now I'm going to simplify the world of steam traps. It's not that difficult. You have two types of steam traps, period, in the statement. Okay, two types. You have the on-off type and you have the continuous flow. The on-off can be mechanical inverted bucket, thermodynamic, thermostat. They have an on-off operation to them. The only one that has a continuous operation is the float and thermostatic design steam trap. So when you're getting ready to go out and test steam traps, one thing you must know is the, the, the operational design of the steam trap. You don't need to know the manufacturer. You need to know if it's a thermodynamic, uh, inverted bucket mechanical, or thermostatic. The other is the f and is continuous flow. There's two different types of testing procedures. The next thing you need to know is the configuration of the steam trap. I always find this interesting because there's so many different types of steam trap configurations. What I want you to understand is where is the discharge orifice? So the discharge orifice is right here on this steam trap here. Downstream of that orifice will be the highest degree of ultrasound will be generated is right there, downstream of this orifice. So on this inverted bucket, downstream of this orifice is where the highest degree of ultrasound will be generated. That's where I want you to put the ultrasonic probe, the stethoscope module onto it. I want to be as close as possible downstream of the discharge orifice because I want to be able to pick up the highest degree of ultrasound to get a very accurate reading. I do not want to be upstream of the steam trap. I do not want to be three meters downstream of the steam trap. I want to be right on the steam trap body at the discharge side of the orifice. So as you can see right here, the contact, the discharge orifice and the steam trap, this particular model is right here. And I'm pointing and putting the stethoscope module right there downstream of that discharge orifice. So I get a very accurate reading of the ultrasound that's coming or being emitted from the discharge orifice. The next thing is, is getting out there and doing this. Okay, um, How do I get started? You do what I call the comparison method. I want you to do is go upstream and desensitize the unit until you're down low on the scale. And I have a meter here and a few slides to show you. Then I want to go downstream, make sure that I do not have any competing ultrasound coming to the discharge side of the steam trap. On T1, I want to make sure I don't have any competing ultrasound coming 
into the steam trap. So what I'm doing is setting my baseline to test this steam trap station. I go upstream and desensitize so my meter's low on scale. Then I go downstream to make sure there is no competing ultrasound downstream. And then I will go and test right at the steam trap. And that is my final test point. So I tell people minimum three test points, T1, T2, T3, your test points. But if you're not limited to three testing points, and there are a lot of times if I pick up ultrasound at T1 here, and uh, I want to see if it gets greater by going up to T4 and see if that's where the ultrasound is being generated, because high-frequency ultrasound is very directional. I'll go up and do another test point, which is shown T4. The same thing with downstream. If a T2 seems to be high for some reason, then I'm going to go to T5 right here and see if the ultrasound's coming back this way. So what I'm saying, whoops, excuse me. Oh, sorry. I hit the wrong button. What I'm saying with this here is you know, you're not limited to three. You know, it's not a common for me to use more than three test points. So, I mean, use more. If you're, on, if you're not sure, just move T1 to T4 and take another test point. Simple as that. So the thing is, is that the same thing with this type of a process steam trap. The one I was showing you before was a drip leg. And the process is the same method. T1 is the inlet. Uh, to the steam trap station right here. And T2 is downstream of the steam trap here and T3. This here happens to be the check valve. The reason I bring that up is that sometimes when you're listening to the steam trap, you'll think that there's linkage problems here in the steam trap. And I want you to go back to the check valve and test that. If the check valve ultrasound is higher than the steam trap sound, it's the check valve that's creating the problem and not the steam trap. And you will find that check valves have a tendency to have a pretty high failure rate because we buy check valves by price. And their warranty on them is typically as soon as you take them out of the box. But anyway, another subject matter of mine. And the same thing as I'm talking about here is that you're not limited to three test points. You know, if you go T1, T2, and T3 here, and you think there might be the check valve causing a problem, you'll go right to the check valve and make it a T4. So the thing with that is, is again, you're not limited to four test points, but you've got to do this. This is such a baseline. You can't walk up to the unit and say, uh, this is 180 psi, and the sensitivity you should be at 25 kilohertz, and the sensitivity should be this. You need to do this, what we call comparison method, or I call baselining. So, ah, easy on-off steam trap. Well, you know, the thing is, is that I, I do my test points, and I come right up here and touch right here at discharge, which is T3. But the meter should be down here at the bottom. Okay, the trap is in the off position. This is inverted bucket or the mechanical design steam trap, thermodynamic and thermostatic. So then when I go to full scale uh, on discharge, it should go up on scale. And you will hear the steam trap discharging the condensate through the steam trap, which generates the ultrasound. And the steam trap will come back into a closed position, which there should not be any ultrasound generated or in the off position. So what we call that is on-off operation. Very easy to test. If I come up and I do my temperature method I told you about, inlet, the steam trap body is up to temperature. I do the comparison. I touch the outlet of the steam trap on on-off. I stand there for 15 seconds, I count to 15, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, to 15. If I hear no cycle, I move on. Why? Well, you know, the thing is, is that it's in the off position. I'm not going to stay around uh, for 20 minutes or 45 minutes to wait for it to discharge. I don't have to. It is performing correctly, so I move on. So. 
But anyway, so there you go, the discharge mode. Now the failure mode. So I go upstream T1, downstream, get my baseline, I come here for T3, and I'm up off the bottom. Okay. High on the scale. Failed. You'll never go back to zero. Failed. Blowing steam. So upstream, downstream to the steam trap, as it comes off the bottom of the scale, and as you more you ride the bicycle, you'll be able to determine if it's leaking or blowing. You know, blowing will go typically to full scale on the, on the meter. So, but as you get more experience with riding a bicycle, so you'll you'll find that they're leaking severely or lowly. Continuous flow. Uh, this is always going to be flowing condensate. Okay, uh, it's continuous flow. It's an F and T type steam trap. So the thing is, is that this steam trap is never going to have a distinct on-off operation to it. It's going to be a slight modulation. Even if there is continuous flow, it modulates a little bit. It goes shh, shh. But that's what we want to do: is look on scale and see this slight modulation. There's two test points here. You test the outlet. You look for this slight modulation. The other thing I want you to do, I told you, listen, because kind of say crack, steam whistles. If it's high on scale here and there's no modulation, it blows. Then I want to go up here and test this air vent mechanism here. You must know where the air vent on the floating thermostatic is located at the ultrasound level is higher at the air vent than at the discharge orifice, then the air vent is failed. The ultrasound level at the air vent always has to be equal or less than the condensate discharge. But the continuous flow, yes, it takes a little bit longer on the bicycle to get a good handle on the testing procedure. When I say a little longer, I don't mean days. I mean if you have like 30 or 40 floating thermostatics, by the time you're done with number 40, you're fine. You're proficient at it. It's, it's not like having to go out there and spend six months to learn how to test a steam trap. I'm talking a couple of hours. So no modulation. You know, it's up there as I show here on the meter, full scale, no modulation. If you're listening to it, like I told you, you need to listen to it, you hear a high-pitched whistling sound. So, two traps, on off, continuous flow. Don't get any easier than that. So, now, I'm done testing. So the next thing I want you to do is institute root cause analysis. It has to be part of your program. So the thing is, is that the team says, hey, yeah, this one's failed. We mark it, uh, tag number, say tag number 64, take it out of operation. I'm going to take that steam trap apart. I want to see exactly what the failure was. What that gives you is a correlation. Number one, it, can, it validates your testing. Validates your testing. Yes, there is failure there. Okay. And then that gives you ability to associate the action on the meter to what type of failure that's occurred into the steam trap. The other is really critical. I'm a huge on root cause analysis, and I've written several papers on it and stuff like that. So I'm really big on root cause analysis. But the root cause analysis is I learned from the reliability people, and thank you for teaching me that. If I if, is that I want to stop failure. The only way to stop failure is understand what caused the failure and then make the necessary, necessary changes to prevent it from occurring again. Um, and that's what root cause analysis does. So it, it's got to be part of your program for a number of reasons. But um, and reliability people taught me a lot about root cause analysis, and thank you for that. So. That is here a question I always have: Do you manage your steam trap stations, or do, or do your steam trap stations manage you? I mean, do you have a management program, or are you just hey, they come in one day, you look at the roof line, and more steam's blowing out, and and uh, we go out and test steam traps, or you know, another one is oh, it's it's uh, PM, it's a yearly uh, 
uh, time to go out and test your steam trap station. You know. That's not a management program. You know, what you have to do is establish what I call a management program. And certain steam trap stations are tested every 30 days, and some are tested every two years. So it's determining, I go back to that thing, is prioritizing which ones really do I have to watch, which ones can cause me production problems and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I travel internationally. I travel a lot. And I've been around to the world. And I see what works. And I see what doesn't work. And I can tell you one thing is that not having the correct tools is the reason for failure. Okay. I mean, if you go down to Ace Hardware and buy them a $10 infrared, you know, and send them out and try to test the steam trap, it's going to fail. So you've got to have the correct tools. And right there, I said before, you've got to have the training to go with the tools. And that's the beginning of a successful program, you know. And the next thing is, and, and the thing I like, and just mention back on high frequency ultrasounds, you buy the units that can be used for other things like electrical corona, um, arcing, bearings. It's a tool is going to be used every day, okay? Which means you're going to be on the bicycle every day. And the more you're on the bicycle, the more proficient you will get. Okay. Next thing, no one's accountable. I always ask, who's accountable? Well, yeah, so and so, what we think. Okay, well, somebody's got to be accountable, okay, and uh, take responsibility, and that's part of the program. You got to have money, okay. If you don't have money in the budget to do it, then don't get started. You got to have money to make the corrections. You know, I've seen uh, it just come off a job site where a uh, steam trap and failed for four years. It tested it four times, four years in a row, and flagged it four four times. And then I got the book of a thousand excuses. You know, I travel the world and I'm collecting all the excuses I hear. You know, I mean, no matter where I say, why isn't this done, or why? Then I get all the excuses, and I tell people, hey, I got a book of a thousand of them, uh, and they're better than the ones you're giving to me. I mean, you must today forget about energy for performance of the production. Uh, for safety, you must have a steam trap management program, and I mean safety. Okay, you said people say, well, "What do you mean by that?" You know, one of your most critical steam traps is on your steam line distribution. And I go in, I find people shut them off, or they don't test them, and they're blocked or plugged or whatever. Well, I'll tell you what: you back condensate up in that drip pocket, and you send a slug of condensate down a steam line, you'll blow it out. One of the things I do is investigate, you know, where things have occurred like that. And believe me, you do not want to be there. It happens in one nanosecond. You will not have time to run. So the thing is, safety is a huge issue. Okay. Next is production. Over and over. I just, you know, I was on a discussion the other day of rotating dryers. Okay. They have no way of testing the steam trap, and they don't know if it's evacuating or something, and cause them production issues. Okay. So number one and number two are the biggest drivers today. And three, yes, energy. Okay. But you you got to understand the steam trap population, the condensate system, the dynamics of it, you know, exactly what it is costing you. Too many times I read these bogus reports. You know, people say, oh, it's costing you $90,000 when it's actually costing $3,000. So emissions, yeah, I've done a lot of work, and, you know, because I belong to the Department of Energy's steam committee and access to the EPA, so I, I can calculate out, as UEs calculate out what their air losses, you know, what the emission reduction is, you know, global warming. And we have to optimize the steam system. It's a tremendous reduction in CO2, SO2, and LX. Here's your goal. I want a steam trap station failure rates of 3% or less, period. You know, the day of saying, oh, my failure rate's 20% is gone. 
I have plans to have populations over 2,000 steam traps, and they're below 1% failure rate. The thing about it is, you say, why? Things have to change. You, if you have failure rates of 20%, 15%, you're going to have to change. So if you embrace change, it's a wonderful world. It's 3% or lower. There's, you're managing the steam trap stations, and it's really good. So change must occur. So you can come to the uh, Swedgelock Energy's website, and these are the best practices. These are papers I've written, and uh, number I, mean, I should have said number three, number five. But excuse me. Number three is a paper I wrote on steam trap leak rates. So when you buy a brand new steam trap, understand what how much is going to leak through or how much it's going to cost you <laughs> brand new out of the box. Because the vendors tell me, oh, my steam trap doesn't leak. There's a leak rate of one ounce per 100 years. You're telling me your steam trap has a lower leak rate than that? Come on. Tell me what your leak rate are. You know, it's per PTC 39. You know, uh, everything leaks. So know the leak rate. Uh, number five, steam trap station installation. Say, well, I don't know how to install. Here you go. Number uh, five, number nine, steam trap station management. Say, yeah, how do I get a management program to go? Right here, paper telling you how to get started. Number ten, steam locking. This is going to come up in process. So when you're out there, it can occur. So you can go read this paper, understand what we call steam locking. Some people call it steam binding. But anyway, uh, number 16 is on tools for testing steam traps, which I kind of went through right here. Number 21, group steam trapping. You know, why? Why not? And things like that. Number 25, proper methods for sizing steam traps. One of the things that causes failure rates is not sizing steam traps correctly. And this will take you through the procedure of how to do it correctly. You know, people ask me, where do you come up with this information? I had some of the greatest mentors in the world, you know, and they taught me a tremendous amount. And I own a lot. And what I'm trying to do is pass that information on to the steam world, what I learned. And the thing is, is that, you know, don't go where I've been and, you know, make mistakes and learn from mistakes. Ask questions. So number 34 is the Steam Trap Station Universal Installation Standards. So those are up there. If you're looking for any type of other information, by all means, you can email me. And I'd be more happy to share. My electronic library is huge. And uh, just an example, somebody emailed me the other day and wanted to know the proceed written procedure for steam blows on brand new steam lines. And of course, I had it, you know, so. Um, here's my contact information, you know. Um, here's my email address and uh, my office number, my cell number, and I definitely recommend emailing me. I travel a lot. It's a little bit difficult to get a hold of me by my cell phone or my office, which I'm very seldom in. Uh, but my emails, I always answer within 24 hours or 48 hours. If I can't, I'll, you know, put you on to one of the other engineers to answer your questions. But I want people to not make, you know, not go where I've been and don't make the same mistakes I've made. I want to make your life easier. But anyway, that is steam trap station testing. You all right. Well, thank you, Kelly. That was really good, and it uh, definitely stirred up some questions here. So let's uh, let's toss a few your way and see what we can get answered before we hit the time uh, allotment. Okay. So um, one of the first questions that came in, um, someone was saying, "I noticed that these steam trap testing stations come with the universal mount." Do all models of steam traps come with universal mounts, or are there certain ones? The universal um, connector or universal mount um, came around 
27 years ago now, 28 years ago. And the uh, connector was that we did not want to be to, to break pipe again to remove a steam trap out of operation for replacement. It's designed specifically for low uh, condensate capacity applications, be it tracers, uh, specifically tracers and steam line drip lights. All manufacturers make uh, universal connectors and universal steam traps to mount onto those connectors and the bolt pattern is universal, so you can mismatch or whatever. On the other steam traps, um, what we call process and non-process process steam traps, do not use universal connectors because no one makes a connector large enough capacity, and they are piped in, what we call hard piped in. So, but anyway, yes. All right. Um, let's see. Here's another one that came in. So they were wondering, how can we deal with interfering noise from production and using an ultrasonic meter during high production periods, which is when you get the maximum flow demands? The thing about it is, is that uh, high frequency ultrasound typically is not a problem with production equipment. Um, we're not scanning. We're using a contact module using uh, the, I should, maybe I should say that all steam trap station testing is done with the contact module. And uh, with the piping and everything, high frequency ultrasound doesn't travel very far. So if you use a comparison method, no problem. The only place you, that you will see difficulties in testing is around high pressure, pressure reducing stations. When I'm taking 400 PSI and coming down to 50 PSI generates a tremendous amount of ultrasound. You can get some situations where it's going to be difficult testing. All other situations, it's pretty easy, pretty easy. So. All right, and a um, couple people asking about, um, you know, hearing actual sound examples. So, you know, those are hard sometimes on these webinars um, to get the audio to work right, yeah. so we didn't have them. but. On our website, um, uesystems.com, we've got a whole section, sound recording library, where you all can hear examples of um, traps that are failing and so on and so forth. So that's a good place to look for uh, examples there. And we probably got most of those from uh, Kelly and his team. So, um, OK, Think let's see. That's, yeah. that's a great question. And uh, yes, go to your website. But the other thing is, too, is, is that I, I encourage the plant to collect their own you know, and add two, you know. So if they hear one that's not um, on the website or whatever, record it and do root cause analysis to determine what the failure rate, and then you can, you know, lock it and, and have it as a reference point. So uh, just because you have them on your website, I encourage people to do more than that. So anyway. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, let's see, just a couple more here. Um, somebody said, um, you know, had we talked about which traps are better suited for the various applications? So, for instance, on the main header, this particular person, we use a bucket, an F and T on their low pressure lines. So maybe you can talk a little bit about which trap for which that's application. A, that's, that's, a, that's a good question, and uh, I don't have enough time to answer it, but I'll give a <laughs> shorter version of my discussion. Okay, if the steam trap goes into your application and lasts 15 years without you touching it, then that's the steam trap that you use. Any, anything that you put in a steam trap lasts six years. But I'll give you an example. Anything below 250 PSI in steam traps should last 15 years. So you want to design the one that lasts 15 years, and that's because you're doing a management program and you know which one does. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> okay. All right. And, you know, Kelly's got his info up there. So for some of you that want uh, to discuss it more, obviously, he's uh, thrown that out there to you guys. Um, all right. Let's just do one more. And uh, those of you that, that had questions that we didn't quite get to, we'll make sure Kelly gets a copy of those so we can get them answered. And then again, you know, anything you think of after. Um, but you, you talked about at the beginning, you know, visual um, infrared and ultrasound being, you know, the, the ways you're going to test. So someone was wondering if infrared will detect failed on-off traps. Uh, accuracy is probably about 30%. Okay. 
Right. And I've been through the infrared cameras, and I've done study after study. It all, it, you have to know the dynamics of the condensate return system. And um, people do not put pressure gauges or, you know, it's, it takes very long to understand the dynamics of the condensate return system, which throws off that discharge temperature. So we have a lot of uh, steam traps that are operating with very low differential in temperature and operating properly. That's not uncommon. So, but anyway. All right. Well, thanks so much, Kelly. I'm going to take the screen back here. Um, got some follow-up slides here um, just to kind of close us out, but that was really good. And as I mentioned at the beginning, so if you popped in late, we, we did record this, so we'll have it up on our website um, probably early next week, if not, if not sooner. So uh, if you came in late or had colleagues, you guys can check that out. Um, so obviously here's our website, uesystems.com. We've got all kinds of information on um, how you can utilize ultrasound for steam and valve inspections and, of course, the different app the other applications as well um, and uh, some of our other training opportunities. Um, I will mention we've also got, as I said, you know, we're going to put the recording of this webinar up there, but we've got all the webinars that we've done in the past up there, and um, if steam obviously if you were here with us today is of interest to you there's another great webinar on there that uh, V Gidry from DuPont did for us I think it was last year um, where you know he's actually going around um, utilizing ultrasound and the other um, test methods to uh, to do the steam trap testing at all of their facilities within DuPont and so he's got a great story to tell about you know taking the things that Kelly talked about today and actually putting them in action and the results that he was able to get so if you need kind of more of a case study um, to kind of further prove why this is something important for you to be doing um, that that webinar by V uh, is really great so you can find that on our site as well um, we hope you'll stay connected with us. You know, we do these once a month, but obviously in between we've got other opportunities to connect. We've got our uh, two different users groups on LinkedIn, the Ultra Probe users group and our Reliable Asset World group. Great place to share information. Um, we really try to let that be kind of peer driven. So, you know, we, we answer questions when, when it's necessary, but uh, for the most part we like to see uh, the folks like you guys out there actually, you know, responding to each other and helping helping each other out. It, it's a really good community there. Um, some upcoming dates. We're going to have a webinar in two weeks uh, where uh, Adrian Messer is going to kind of unveil our new Ultra Probe 401 Digital Grease Caddy Pro. So we've got a new product coming out. Um, so those of you that are uh, using ultrasound for lubrication, um, this is going to be a great new tool. So come check that out so you can learn what all is involved. Um, and then next month we're going to have Terry Harris. He's going to be talking about matching the different predictive technologies to failure mode. So it should be a pretty cool um, session uh, on December 18th. And then our upcoming conferences, Reliable Asset World and Ultrasound World 11 in uh, Clearwater Beach, Florida, June 2 through 5. So hopefully you all can mark your calendars for that and, and plan to join us. And with that, I'll leave our contact info up there. So certainly uh, let us know if there's anything that you guys have questions on, and uh, we'll be happy to get back with you. And again, Kelly, thanks so much, and hope everybody has a great afternoon.